Michael Graham, for whose parish magazine Eugene wrote articles for many years and which later were compiled into the volumes through the Bible, uh, Christian philosophy itself. Uh, you can see them at the back in the hardback volume. Michael was introduced to Eugene by his parents and uncle at a very early age and attended Parkland for many years. He was lucky enough to have a number of personal sessions with Eugene. He subsequently became interested in meditation, practicing now for almost 20 years, and later yoga, mindfulness, and Buddhism. He attempts to transcribe Eugene's talk, Sankhya Philosophy, in which he has a particular interest in. Michael. Does it mean it's not sound? No, no, no. What is it? Technically. <laughs> oh, right. That's why you really I could shout if that's any better. This is a sound. <laughs> While we're sorting that out, if I talk at a louder volume, is that no? No. <coughs> How's that? Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. That's amazing. I've dropped my volume by at least half. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll make a start, and um, if we don't get further than this, that's fine. Um, so, Eugene gave two talks on the Wheel of Life at Parklands back in the 1970s, <coughs> and he characteristically described the symbology in great detail and shared many of his own personal insights as well as much of the conventional interpretation. This um, line drawing was done for those talks uh, and was handed out, and I'm grateful to Hepsi for having dug it out uh, and emailed me so I can put it there today. Uh, you'll be, if anybody's used to this diagram, they'll be used to seeing a very colorful painted version, but this stripped it back to the essential symbols uh, that Eugene described. Now we can go around the symbols in a logical manner and explain how they outline our human nature and reveal the complex processes that occur in our minds. The way I remember Eugene presenting the symbology was to present it as the cycle of an individual life. But since then I've come to realize that this cycle can be applied in a different way in daily life and as part of a mindfulness or meditation practice. And as such, it can help us to become aware of the processes that go on within us, to understand them, to come to terms with them, and show us how we can intervene, particularly in negative or repetitive behaviours, thought processes, and help us deal with unhelpful feelings. So the wheel itself, um, is a whole symbol of the sum of its many parts which was seen in deep contemplation. The wheel is being eaten by a demon that Eugene named time and conventional Buddhism refers to as impermanence or sometimes Yama, Lord of Death. But all refer to the same state of impermanence <coughs> or change. The wheel consists of three concentric circles Containing in the center, containing in the center, a pig, a snake, and a cockerel, where the pig represents ego, signifying ignorance of our true nature. The snake signifies aversion or anger, and the cockerel, or sometimes a bird, signifies desire or attachment. So we've got this trinity: ego, desire, and aversion. And the, sorry, okay, the sorry. Technical, technical interlude. Thank you. <coughs> 
How's that? I can hear myself now. Sound is up somewhere here. Um, so where were we? The cockerel and snake are shown as coming out of the mouth of the pig, indicating that desire and aversion arise as a result of ignorance, though they are in fact codependent. That is, they exist and can only exist together and to resolve or overcome the hold of, that any one of this trinity has over us um, dissolves all three states because none of them can exist without the others and it's known as a theory of codependent origination. Just go back one. So the next circle out, this one, um, displays six realms of human existence carefully arranged in pairs of opposites, described as three higher, humans, gods, and titans, and three lower, animals, hungry ghosts, and beings in hell. These realms, we could spend, we could spend a whole talk on these realms. Um, they're co-present in all of us, and they vary only in the stress and proportion uh, in every one of us as there's no such totally separate realms in existence. I'm not going to say any more about um, the realms as I want to look at the outer circle of 12 symbols. There is in fact a fourth circle uh, which Eugene didn't mention um, but it simply shows it's in two halves. It's this one here next to the centre and it simply shows beings on one side um, going up as a result of their virtuous actions and beings on the other side um, coming down towards hell as a result of their uh, other actions, shall we say. Christian symbology, if you go into a church, you'll see sometimes old churches I've seen on the chancel arch, the old paintings of the saints rising up to heaven on the one side as a result of their virtuous actions and the sinners descending towards hell on the other. Uh, and it strikes me that this is a very simple, uh, similar symbology. So I want to move on to have a look at the 12 symbols in the outer circle. Um, and remember that this is not a, it's not a Western causal concept idea where one thing earlier in time causes the next thing later in time. Each link in the circle going around the outside of 12 um, is conditioned by the one preceding it and the arising of the following link is dependent in principle on the presence of the previous one. And each one presupposes all the others in a logical progression and form a karmic cycle. So if we start at the top, we have a blind woman sometimes shown as a man, but Eugene insisted was correctly a woman, signifying an infinite power as a universal drive. A drive that's blind to represent the lack or refusal of intellectual formulation, and so not committed to any particular form. Now, the Sanskrit word is avidya, and it's conventionally translated as ignorance. But Eugene translated it not as ignorance, because he used to say that ignorance implies willful disregard of something. So he said it really should be translated as nescience, which is simply not knowing in any specific sense. So the blind woman is power, all power is sentient, feels itself, its own movement, but at this first stage it's not bound itself to any particular form, because it feels a form to be a limitation on its infinite potential enjoyment. So it's continually on the move, it's blind because it's objectless, and it's objectless because it's committed to infinite movement. Next we have a potter, a man busy making pots, or in principle, a power that is making containers which results in a pluralization of appetite. The drive of the blind woman by her infinite weavings crossing and recrossing each other through its infinite motion produces what might be termed spheres containing processes. So the potter is the principle of the production of finite containers 
and therefore objects in the objectless world of the blind woman. The blind woman gave birth to a potter, and the potter models a monkey. So the pot is a finite being, and in Eugene's words, by its rotation, relatively separated from all the other spheres, then this apparently separated sphere is a monkey. A monkey is the key to man. It is the evaluator, the consciousness, the sentience, insofar as it is locked up inside one of these spheres. Now Eugene postulated that our sole evidence that there is an external world is because we do not initiate every change that occurs in our body. And when a change occurs that we know we haven't initiated, we suppose some other being or cause outside ourselves has done so. And the monkey is continually hopping between the external world and the internal world. And we're very, normally we're very conscious in our daily life uh, uh, of these two realms, which are the cause of us believing that there is an observer and an observed, and that the two are not identical. The monkey sees two men in a boat, the next symbol, and consciousness gives rise to name and form, and the words in the Sanskrit there, nama and rupa, name and form. The boat is our body with a skin which has an inside and an outside. Inside us we have a collection of names, and by names we can add to that concepts, ideas, etc., and forms that we believe to be outsiders. So this allows us to divide the world into psyche or soul and soma or body, a collection of names, ideas, concepts, insiders, and beings and causes that we believe to be outside of us. But we remember that this inside and outside in the symbology are simply the product of the potter or the spinning that the potter is creating within a universal connative drive. And I feel this, this accords with one of Eugene's um, statements that we are processes rather than entities. The body boat is floating on a sea. Uh, and it's a houseboat, often shown as a building. Um, in the wheel, but usually on water. The six windows represent our six senses. That is, the five physical senses that we're normally aware of, uh, and the six, which Eugene termed as common to the other five, and Buddhism calls mind, and which in essence does the same thing. It encompasses all the senses. The sense organs have a duality because stimulation has a duality. And that duality is that some stimulation is assimilable and therefore pleasurable, and some are not assimilable and therefore painful. And the sense organs are on the alert to discriminate between pleasant and unpleasant stimulation. And we all know from our own lives how this is, it's a great conditioning factor in the sense that we tend to move towards the pleasurable and away from the painful. Sixth position is a pair of lovers. This represents the contact of the sense organs with the external world and the contact of the external world with us as indiv an individual point of reaction. So the pair of lovers means stimulation and the contact between the external world and the sense organs is represented as lovers, and the lovers are simply the inside and the outside of the sphere that the potter has created. So that is, the psyche is a lover, and what it loves is total reality outside of itself. So that in loving the world, we have a tendency to extend understanding, power, and a grasp of reality beyond ourselves. So we're stimulated by contact with the world and simultaneously all the energy going out from an individual into the world, pleasure, pain, liking, disliking, grasping, failing, is simply the relation between two lovers, ourselves within our skin and the <coughs> universal beyond our skin. 
So when contact occurs, we have an arrow in a man's eye. And this means the continuous process of effective response or feeling that arises from the stimulation. We receive a stimulus, we either assimilate it at an appropriate rate and like it, or we cannot and we dislike it to that degree. But if we like something or don't like something, we have a preference. If we like it, the preference is that that something will be present with us, or if it's an assimilable, that it will be absent. So the arrow in the man's eye is the mood that arises logically from the contact of ourselves with our external universe. The eighth position <coughs> represents the desire that the pleasant shall be re-experienced. So it's this liking and disliking passing into the next phase, represented by a drinker served by a woman. And again, in Eugene's analysis, woman refers to the connative and affective side of nature, and man to the intellective. So this means that the drink is served by a woman, which means that once the affection, the feeling emotion is roused, the non-intellective side, that is the female side, will want to repeat the pleasant stimulus. So that the male, the drinker, the differentiator or the selector, is being fed by his own connative, emotive, non-intellective side. So after thirsting, this thirsting automatically produces a desire to grasp at the fruit. So that's to say, if a thing is pleasant enough, not only do you want to re-experience it, but actually you'd like to own it to guarantee that you can re-experience it. So therefore you wish to possess whatever it is that gives the pleasant feeling. And this is a logical response from the contact of the senses and the like-dislike response. I move towards likes, I would like to re-experience, and to guarantee I can re-experience them, I would like to own them. <coughs> the next logical step in this 12-symbol go-round is bhava, or sexual union. Sometimes shown as a couple engaged in intercourse, sometimes shown as a single standing reflective person. But what it signifies is the union of the man and the object that he's thirsted after. He decides to appropriate that which will allow him to repeat his pleasant experience, and in doing so comes into union with that object. He has identified. And the man who has identified can no longer separate himself from that identified with. And this is what is represented by the sexual reunion symbol, identification. So from the union of the man with the object, the identification, this, from this emerges a result, represented by a woman giving birth to what is really the product um, of the man and the object. So the aim of what is born is to guarantee that he will retain his hold on this desirable object. So whether this be a dynasty or a business or an organization um, or his interest, whatever it might be, it's aimed at continuing the pleasure experienced. And the man who is so identified is committed to living and extending his life in this way. However, there is a natural term an end beyond which any given form cannot be developed. And when this end is reached, then the necessity of death arises. Because you can't be released from the thing into which you've put your energy other than by taking that energy out. So without the destruction of the object, the identified psyche cannot be released. But being released, we've gone full circle and that energy is now once again the blind woman. So the potter created that division, the separation which lays the foundation for the necessity of death to release the energy back into the infinite. And yet, the blind woman is continuously differentiating and producing by potting activity continuous zones of possible identification. And these zones of identification are local deaths. 
So this death only means that locally there is identification, and in the words of Eugene, there is no other death. So just to summarise, um, it might be helpful just to go back to the original line drawing for a second. There we go. Universal energy, by its processes, formulates individual minds inside their bodies. The locked mind inside the body has a dual aspect, uh, an inner psychological side, a mind-body complex, and an outer physical side. Interaction with the world takes place by the sense organs, which are the conduit for stimulation of body and mind in relation with the world. The stimulation, depending on preference, creates a desire to re-experience and own what is being experienced, and this results in the binding or identification of the man and the object, which results in giving birth along the line of the development of that object to its term, whence arises the necessity of release back into the universal energy. So this is the in-principle view described by the symbology. And Eugene gave what I think of as a high-level interpretation, which appears to be an overview of the process of an individual life. But we can also interpret it in another way. We can interpret the symbols in, in many different ways on many different levels. But we can bring it down to a level where we can see the same principles operating in our daily life. So, for example, like the blind woman, we, we, we weave about in the world. We don't really know what we're doing. We like to think we do. But every day we go out, we do things. We don't know exactly who we're going to meet, what we're going to happen. We all know every day can throw up surprises. Each day is a different journey. And to that extent, we go through the world in a way that is slightly blind and we have to deal with every moment as it arises. As we weave around, we're constantly experiencing and recording our experiences. The experience recorded, especially when highly charged by emotion, like or dislike, is there, it's in its pot, it's awaiting stimulation when conditions are ripe to be referred back to. Our monkey mind is always on the alert, either for attractive bananas or banana skins to avoid. The monkey is constantly leaping instantaneously between our mind and body, trying to relate the forms outside of us, the things we hear, the things we smell, etc. Um, and all the names, ideas and experiences inside of us is constantly trying to relate the two. We're subject to almost continual stimulation through our senses. We experience preferences, <coughs> liking, disliking, or neutral. And we react to things. Our experience, our conditioning, makes us react to things in a way in which normally we have no choice over. We play out our reaction to a stimulus situation, whether it's for the first or the umpteenth time, and so we're bound to it, we're, we're identified with it. In a sense, we don't really understand the processes that go on in our daily reactivity. Um, and our actions all the time as we go around this cycle, almost instantaneously, are creating and modifying the karmic seeds that we're in effect giving birth to by our actions that will ripen when the necessary conditions are presented. So as long as we're in a reactive situation, um, this is playing itself out, we're blind to the true nature of what's happening within us. And eventually our, our reaction, whatever it is we have, plays itself out, the situation fades in time until it's triggered off once more, and unless we learn to be conscious and intervene in this process, we're bound to go travelling around this wheel again and again until our reactivity is eventually worn out. Now in practice, we're largely unconscious of these steps. They happen almost instantly, particularly when we're blinded through a, con a conditioned reflex or an engram, and we progress through the stages of preference first, grasping and identification almost instantaneously. Buddhist 
teaching was to say the way to get off the wheel and not go around forever is to give up the thirst and go back quickly. Otherwise, we continue to thirst and drink. Now, to do that in the sense of our whole life process would be an enormous task, and the Buddhists say it takes many, many lifetimes to achieve. But if we wish to change some of our habits now, we can learn to practice in a small but helpful way. And I wanted to say now something about mindfulness practice or, or meditation, but mindfulness is now as mindfulness is established as a Western secular practice uh, that's devoid of religious connotations, which for many people is very, very helpful. So in the theory of mindfulness practice, we learn first to calm our physical bodies by sitting upright, breathing regularly and consciously. We become grounded in our bodies and then just rest, allowing whatever is arising to arise while we observe, curious at what's arising, but without being attached to it. We notice that thought is always arising, it's being for a time, and then it disappears for another to take its place in a seemingly endless procession. And the aim here is not to stop thought at all, but to be aware of its flow and not caught up in it. So we can describe mindfulness as knowing what is happening while it is happening, without preference, experiencing all states without judgment, simply being aware, but not drawn in and caught up with them. And as we realize that we have an undercurrent of thoughts, moods, emotions, attitudes, and sensations in our physical body, we can, using different exercises, learn to work as observers with that which is observed and yet not be identified by it. And exercises in compassion, particularly self-compassion, are very helpful in coming to terms with ourself and all that entails. So by bringing our minds into focus, working with direct perception to push the boundary of what we're normally aware of, can lead to insights about our inner processes so that we don't just know what's happening when it's happening, we recognize what's happening when it's happening. So we know it in the sense that we're aware of it, but we recognize it in the sense that we understand the pattern and the factors that are actually causing us to act and think and feel in the way that we do. And we can come to realize uh, with this but, and I quote um, a gentleman, Rob Nairn, that the average person is a random collection of habitual patterns built up through life. And I think if you put some thought into that, um, you realise that's quite true. So we know our busy monkey mind is always doing something. It's either busy with its own processes or busy with external stimulation. And the mind can be so automatic that it does things without us realising it and becomes locked in a sort of mental delusion of the way we take, of the way we think things are or should be. And this can be very solid and, and very isolating. Until we focus on our self-perception, we hardly realize it's there. And many of our thought processes are so subtle that we're not normally aware of them. And the way we view ourselves is really is the greatest delusion. But because of that delusion, because of the way we think we are, we keep on reinforcing it. And that is the set of ideas about ourselves, our lives, things around us, the way things should or shouldn't be, tends to define who we are. But in being that, at the same time, it cuts us off from the rest of the world. And if we allow to continue and interrupt it, prevents us from seeing what's beyond that state. And we must remember that the whole of this wheel originates in that centre symbol of ego, desire and aversion, known in Buddhism as the three poisons, ignorance, desire, anger, ignorance, desire, aversion. Now mindfulness on its own doesn't necessarily lead to insight, which is the key to freeing the mind, but we can move towards this if, if we have enough interest and energy. The process is to first learn to calm the mind, become aware of the processes occurring, and learn to intervene in, in these to change our habits and adopt a more open attitude to life. 
And in terms of the wheel, I spent a long time describing those symbols, this can only be done between the stages of contact and thirst. Once we go beyond the thirst, we tend to be into grasping and we very quickly identify. And once we've identified with something, we go under the law governing that thing, as Eugene used to say, and it's actually too late, we're off round again. The key to intervention is between the stages of contact, when we're in a position to realise what's happening first, and this might be with a, a positive experience or a negative experience, and then actually learning to take a step back and sit with what's being experienced rather than rushing off into um, reactive behaviour. Um, <coughs> I would just like to finish by reading the final paragraph of the two talks that Eugene gave. Um, there's an awful lot in there in the symbology. Theory of mindfulness practice is very easy to say, but it takes years of practice. Um, but good things don't necessarily come easily. We all know we have to work at things, um, and we have to embody things. It's no good things remaining in the intellect. That was something that Eugene was often saying. So the, fi the final paragraph of this talk, um, after Eugene had gone on to, he actually compared the message of Buddha and the message of Christ. <coughs> and he said of Buddha, one is saying, give it up, and the other, Christ is saying, don't give it up, whatever the stimulation is. Look at it. But if you look at it, you will give it up. <coughs> and if you give it up, you will have to look at it. And he said, Buddha and Christ, two incarnations of cosmic logic, were saying exactly the same thing, but in two opposite ways. And he did go on to note um, that with the way of Christ, one had the experience of going round the wheel. So, very short paragraph, I say, which is the last paragraph from the Eugene in the talks. Um, now, most people are adept at blaming other people for the imp impedances they encounter. But the reality is that in the period between death and rebirth, when patterning the next life in the light of the previous life, that you have chosen all the necessary impedances for your enlightenment. You have deliberately gone into all those situations where people are going to contradict you in order to be turned back on yourself to discover that you and no other being constitute your own destiny. Uh, and that was the sort of punchline, like knockout punch, I remember Eugene giving at the end of many talks. Mm. Um, and I think it was sort of characteristic of the effect um, that he had on many people over those years. So thank you. about 10 o'clock last night if I would like to say something about the group that we call Yanta. And I said, no, I wouldn't, but I will. <laughs> Eugene started the group that we call the Yanta group in, Margaret? 1969. 1969. And it ran with his and David's direction until Parkland was closed. And... Um, after it was closed, it, it always ran as a ladies' group and a men's group, and both groups continued for a while afterwards. The ladies' group miraculously has survived and still runs now. Um, so let's just have a look at what we do. 
it's not included in the programme as one of Eugene's activities because it proved to be impossible to summarise in a sensible way. So let's get rid of the words first. The word yantra, um, for those who aren't familiar with it, actually means a diagram or a structure. Um, and we use three words to describe what we do there. The second word is mantra, which you may be more accustomed to. Mantra is a group of words or a saying or a sound or a single word. And if you've learnt meditation with some groups, you may have been given a mantra to say while you meditate. But mantra is, is a significant word symbol. And in fact, any word is a mantra because all words are significant. And as usually taught us, each letter has its own significance. So mantra is a sound structure or a word. The third word that we use in relation to the class is mudra, which again you may not be familiar with, but mudra means a gesture or a posture or a body language. So we can get rid of those three words straight away. If you can compare them with um, a theatre, you go to the theatre and the curtain goes back and the stage is set, and what you see there is a structure. There's probably a backdrop which might be a river bank or a castle or the interior of a house. And that is the yantra, the structure on which the play is going to take place. Then you see the furniture, maybe there's a desk there and a chair and a window in the backdrop. And there are people, a man at the desk has a particular posture. And when you look at him, you'll know a bit about his mood from the way he's sitting. And the woman in the chair, she might be sitting very primly, or she might be just lounging very extravagantly. And her gestures will tell you how she's feeling. That's the mudra. No one of them speaks, and they tell you something. Is Gwendolyn coming tomorrow? What time do we have to go out? And straight away you've got words which have significance, which begin to set up images in your mind that extend beyond the words. So yantra, mantra, and mudra are just Sanskrit words for what goes on in any play. And that's what we do on, on the yantra group. Let's call it the drama group. For booking purposes, we always call it the drama group. It's a group which runs um, once a fortnight now in a church hall in Hale Barnes. Um, it's um, quite a small group, not at all so that it's open to anybody. Um, but we wanted to talk about it because if, um, if it was a group at my exercise club that I go to, it would have a red star behind, beside it. Green means there's plenty of people going and it's safe. Orange means it's getting vulnerable. And a red star means there aren't a lot of people there. Right. So the Yantra has a red star beside it. I think we all who go have such fun there, it'll go on. Because every week is hilariously funny <coughs> and impossibly sad and very, very educational. Um, the format of the group is that one person chooses to work that, for that evening as a protagonist. And we have, when the group was running at Parklands for how many years it was, we did structured exercises. Always David or Eugene would introduce an exercise and we, most of us had an opportunity of experiencing that exercise. We did, um, what did we do? We did. The, the geography of the universe, north, south, east, west, what they mean to us, that's our north pole, this is our south pole. Hmm? Go east, young man, go west, they have different meanings, don't they? So we looked at how we can experience north, south, east, and west, and the points in between. We worked on the Hebrew letters, what the deeper meaning is of the Hebrew letters. It took us a long time, that year or 18 months, very, very deep exercise. Um, the rest of them have all gone out of my head just now. If you talk to people, they'll all tell you what we've done. We now still do some of those structured exercises. Um, but we also have become much freer in what we do. Um, we often work on the cause of a problem. Michael talked a bit about cause and effect. If something is going on, my voice is croaking away, there is a cause for it somewhere. And that cause is somewhere in the field of energy in which I'm living. It might be on the personal level, and something which I, which happened through interrelationship in my life. It might be on the more subtle level, 
It might even be from a universal level. But we can work on the cause of something by looking basically at and what's the cause. And somebody else will get up and, and feel inside themselves what's the cause of this problem. And by gestures and by sounds, we learn more about it. And then we look at what's the solution to it. How are we best in our highest level of consciousness going to solve this problem? And somebody else will get up to an act that point to the solution. And that's fascinating, what you're offered as possibilities. And if it's right out of your normal way of living. But not always attainable straight away. So we also look for a resolution for the way in which could we can perhaps resolve that problem more readily and more practically and with our present here and now energy. We work a lot on the meaning of words or on questions. We can ask the yantra a question. And I should perhaps say that the yantra is actually a diagram on the floor. Usually when he was setting up the group, discussed with David what diagram to use. And because we're familiar in the Western world with the zodiac, he chose to use the zodiac. So we use a circular diagram, and we, it's got four triangles on it which make 12 points. Mm -hmm. And the 12 points are the names <coughs> points of the zodiac. But that's irrelevant in some ways because they all represent different types of personality, different ways in which we can relate to the world or solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And they're all inside all of us. I'm sure you all know what your zodiacal sign is, don't you? You perhaps don't like using the zodiac for fortune telling. And I don't either, but as a personality study, it's very useful. We do tend to behave in a certain way because of our birth point. Or perhaps we behave in the opposite way sometimes. But we have other choices in us of how we behave. So if you want to experiment with the Yantra group, um, do feel free to do so. Monday evenings, talk to me or FC or Margaret or Shabbat and um, let us know your interest. Just mention it's, it's everybody now, not just ladies. Yes, yes. A couple of years ago we integrated the male and female groups, so it's an integrated group. <coughs> Any more anybody wants to say? much and uh, I mean I think we've had um, three excellent talks already um, which presages well for the rest of the weekend um, but this right. is a point at which our speakers that, that speakers thank you um, can be targeted so um, <laughs> I have a series I have a series of questions here and we've got about 25 minutes. So, shall I read the first one? Which is... Um, <laughs> I won't say who said this. Um, yes, yeah, no, sorry, I can't say it. This, this question la is labelled for me, which is a shame, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it says, a fifth of women at the age of 45 have no children. Surely this can't just be due to leaving it too late or to choosing not to. What is my opinion on what is actually happening? Uh, am I allowed to pass? <laughs> so, are there any women here under 45 who will tell me why you're not having children? Um, no, I actually have no idea. And I'm sure it's entirely an individual matter. We all choose how we live our own lives. Um, and maybe the question is pointing more at the fact that a lot of women can't have children. Um, and again, I don't know is the answer. We can point to nuclear fallout in the atmosphere and say, like the salmon, perhaps that's affected our fertility. And it might be so. I know that male sperm fertility has fallen by about 50% in the last 30 years or so, is it? worry isn't it? Um, but I have to say, if I put my Eugene hat on, the population, the, the world population is far too great at the moment, perhaps it's a good thing. Just a brief comment from a, a, a woman who... Is that okay? Can you hear? Right, right up onto your chin. 
So she chilled with it, just below your bottom lip. From a woman who hasn't had any children <coughs> and who chose not to, in my um, case, it was exactly what I've been speaking about this morning. Background experiences and um, affect our upbringing, our decisions are affected by everything that happens to us and our ancestors. So for me, at a very, very young age, like before puberty, I decided I did not want to have children. And although in my mind, it still felt like an open choice throughout puberty and 20s and 30s, when I finally did meet the man I actually wanted to marry in my 40s, I still did not want children. So it's a personal choice. Thank you. Yes, I can add a comment. Obviously, not as a woman, but from experiences related uh, of women I know, um, who seem seem to me to fall into. I can think of three um, situations, without going into what could be background, ancestry, karma, etc., etc. My partner, for one, and at least two other women I know, did not have children because, it, at the time, it never felt right. They didn't feel in a situation where their partner wanted children. They didn't feel quite secure enough. It, to sum it up, this, the saying is just, it didn't feel right, even though they would have liked children and they love children now, and in a sense, there is a bit of regret not having them, but they accept that that was how life progressed, and it somehow just never came together. I can think of several other women I know who, in whom the biological urge, the drive to have children, and the need was so strong that they went ahead uh, and had a baby um, without necessarily being in a secure situation, without necessarily having a husband or a man around. Um, the need to reproduce, to have the baby was so strong, they just actually went ahead. And then I can think of someone else who would not have children because they could not face the thought of childbirth. It was so painful to them. Now eventually that person's gone on and had to love the children, brought them up, loves them to bits, but still can't deal with childbirth. And there's potentially some record there, you know, in her life that's actually um, producing that. And I also know, I can think of several other women I know who just actively said, I do not want children. I do not want to devote my life to bringing up um, young people, I want to do other things with it. So that's just a range from, from my experience. Um, but what it is for any one individual, obviously, will be unique and special to them. Is it still working? Yes. Can I say something? Yes. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, having had children, um, talking about background and all the rest of it, I'd just like to say the reverse can also happen. You can have children to try and put the past right. You know, so it's like a double-edged thing, isn't it? You, you don't have them because you don't want the past to repeat itself, but you can have them to try and put the past right. So it's just a point of view, isn't it? Just a quickie, um, we're all different, and that's the answer. Just, just a, uh, a quick one again. Um, we actually did a young trick exercise um, a good many years ago on the fact that it wasn't a good time to bring children into the world. Yes. And um, 
Joan Crane wrote a wonderful poem on that subject, which I'm sure Rosie Bar still has. Um, and Eugene, in fact, also wrote a play on Is It the Right Time? It's one of the creation plays, isn't it, Tessie, where he starts off, Is It Time? And he talks about the right time to bring children into the world. Yeah. And the conclusion is that it's never the right time. <laughs> I know when my mother had, was pregnant with me, she had a tea party, a famous tea party, with six friends who were all pregnant. And this was 1935, and war was already threatening. And they had a very sombre tea party, because it wasn't a good time to have children. And they were all busy doing it. So it goes on and on, doesn't it? It's never the right time to bring children into the world. And that doesn't answer the question of why people these days want children and have difficulty in conceiving. And that's another issue which may relate to the preservatives in the food. We don't know. Could I just add something, if I may? From the point of my recent Sorry. observations. Just a minute, shall them up? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah. Just quickly, I wanted to say it's only fairly recently, anyway, practically, that women have had any choice in the matter. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what the proportion would have been previously. If yeah, they had had the choice or the means yeah. to support themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wanted to add, on behalf of yeah, on behalf of the children, the child, that my observations is the right time for them. Could I just add that it just this doesn't take away at all from the difficulties of people who do want children and they don't appear. Um, but it isn't always the woman. And this is something which has been in the news recently that men need to look at their part in this process, but also maybe it's to do with the spirit as well, and it, but it doesn't take away from the, the real agony that people go through when they do want somebody and they don't, and they don't have to. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm can you hear me okay? Um, I was actually the originator of this question and what I have noticed is that an awful lot of young, healthy looking women are really struggling and what I'm wondering is, is it, is it from Michael's perspective that there is, there has something gone on that has prevented this happening or are we looking at something much bigger um, why these apparently healthy young women in greater and greater numbers are really struggling mm -hmm. and in spite of help from the medical profession and other others um, that it is still not happening what, what are we actually looking at mm -hmm. anybody else uh I think it's a question of, of uh, what Zohar was saying early on with the um, diagrams that she was showing us. I think there's a tendency to cerebralize ourselves, and I think a lot of ladies have perhaps um, educated themselves out of the womb area. And I've certainly found when working with ladies in homeopathy, uh, if I can get them to drop their energy down to the womb area, a lot of changes take place. And I've noticed where a lady can, is unable to conceive, <coughs> if I can get her to drop her energy um, through meditation work and focus, we've got a better chance. But I think there's a lot more going on, of course, in the spiritual level. One of the um, re homeopathic remedies that I found was really successful, <coughs> looking at the most fertile animal in the, in the world, I looked at the salmon, and I think she conceived... Uh, probably a week after uh, uh, receiving the remedy salmon, but it took two it took two years to get to that point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our daughter was quite desperate and about to go down the medical route until her husband's job took her to Korea, and there she had um, Eastern medicine, 
um, of daily acupuncture and within six weeks she was pregnant. does Eugene give for the, um, the sentient power, the initial blind woman symbol, uh, being blind? So I'm talking about, I'm not talking about um, our behaviour as we go around the cycle, our blind behaviour that leads into the next cycle. I'm talking about the very beginning where he says, where, where you said that he says um, that the, the sentient power is depicted first of all as a blind woman. Why is it a blind woman, does he say? And do you know anything about that, please? Mm -hmm. Well, I can, I can say uh, what little I do know about it. Um, a blind woman has an infinite universal drive in principle. So it is simply the principle of that blind universal power not committed to any particular form because in a sense, it doesn't want, if want is the right word, a restriction. It wants complete openness, infinity. And I think within that, we could start up a, a whole debate on intentions. You know, where is the creative intent? And I think we would all say, um, listening to Eugene talking about sentient power, that within sentient power there is a creative intent. Um, but this is simply uh, the universal drive on its own as a principle. If you then think about potentially bringing intent into it, then you have the potter. But the way Eugene described it was that the universal drive, by its driving, crisscrosses itself, if you imagine it in a linear sort of way, and that each, each intersection point of the drive becomes a pot. So I think, I think he's essentially talking about the creative aspect um, of sentient power, which produces the pots or the beings um, in that overall interpretation, if, if that makes any sense. But I had thought about this and I thought, yes, the, the, where is the intent and the, and the creativity in this? Um, and I came to the conclusion that the symbols are simply separating out the functions without necessarily having that overall intent there behind it. Is that it? Is that any help? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I could, first of all, I'd just like to say, because um, there's an old sort of mangled English word for a tribal world, word which is jamboree, and it meant that when you get a lot of people of a like mind together, they just seem to have a good time. They bounce off each other. So I think we've already started by having a jamboree, and it's, it's very good indeed. And the standard of the lectures this morning have been ah, yeah, yeah. Stunning, stunning. To carry on with, with, to take it 
this, sorry, the, my response to what has just been said is that surely um, before anything is created, everything, you know, the, the thing which is, the Tao or whatever you want to call it, must be blind because there's nothing to see. There's no, it, that's why everything starts with let there be light. There can be nothing seen until you initially, uh, I would have thought that uh, sort of from um, why the a lady is blind in the first place. There's nothing yet to see until the potter gets going. and that if we don't push the other person back, they will push us back. You know, I think there's a lot in the world, there's a lot more confrontation going on in the world. We're seeing a real and very sad polarisation. The numbers of rich are getting greater, the numbers of, of those in poverty are getting greater. The confrontation between um, powers, you know, whether it's whether it's Trump and North Korea, um, the rhetoric is going up. Britain splitting away from Europe. Um, it seems that there's been heightened division, more confrontation, more separativity, uh, and where it's going, goodness only knows. I'm just delighted that there are groups like this and many, many thousands of people in the world who don't follow that path, who are much more committed to unity, to love, to compassion as a principle, even if it's hard work. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think world events and, and the present um, polarizing in the world is extremely worrying. But if we remember, Eugene used to talk about this you know, he, he used to refer to events that would happen, division, separation, nuclear activities, you know, and it's, it was really very worrying stuff. Um, and who knows what would happen, but if we don't have the pressure of this polarity that's going on now, they'll also, you know, that brings about a need to actually resolve it. And who knows whether that will be a short or a long path. But as we know about human nature, when it tends to sort of state a point or a position, instead of giving it up and getting off the soapbox, it tends to just climb a bit higher. Uh, and that's always worrying. <coughs> I probably won't um, describe this very well, but uh, um, we used to go and see a uh, channel, and his answer to this was that the world was moving up the chakras, um, up to love, and as a result, the what he called the, the, the one below that, he called it will and power, and he said as a result of that, will and power, the will and power energy is um, less abundant and people were therefore fighting for the will and power that was available before we moved up as a, as a world, as an earth, to, to the power of love. Uh, I can't say I understand that, but it, it, it's a way. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say was... It's gone. That's gone. Sorry. I just want to, just want to say something about the issue of power 
and power is essentially the change, the rate of change of energy. And um, the will to power really promotes change. And um, you know, historians will tell us that um, between 1400 and 1700, the conditions in this country essentially didn't change that much. But what's happened in the last 50 years is we've seen a massive rate of change. <coughs> you know, in our own lifetimes, we're doing things entirely different from our parents and grandparents. And um, all, also, um, when you dis when you take a decision, it isn't you don't primarily look for what you actually want. If you conceive something in your mind, you're not likely to find it. What you end up doing is rejecting things as you see them. You re it's the thing you end up with when you've rejected all the other possibilities. And what's in front of us now is is <coughs> appalling. Um, populism is driving us towards the the extremes. And um, you know, sane people seem to be in the minority. But you know, what happened at I'll just say one thing, what happened at the end of the Second World War, we realised what we didn't want in the form of Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and maybe we need to have Trump and others just to decide what we don't want. Perhaps mm -hmm. a final word to Ron at the session. One. <coughs> much of what can be... Mm, much of what can be experienced or seen as the cause of the drive to power is the one single word and experience, fear. Fear is something that is operating in most individuals and is particularly um, more prominent in some than others. But that's another <coughs> cause of the drive to power. Thank you very much, all of you. It's really good. We need to stop now because it's lunchtime. Uh, going downstairs for lunch, um, and we have 75 minutes for lunch, so we have plenty of time to have your lunch. We can go and discuss and talk and meet each other. I'm going to declare the bookshop closed for the moment, so I can have some lunch and say to my helpers that uh, we will reopen it. Uh, after a reasonable amount of time, you can come back up here, browse the books, talk, and so on. And the coffee and tea area is open all day. So we're going to lunch now, and we reconvene here. If you get back here at 2.10, then we can start on the bus at 2.15.